The United States no longer has a president that blames COVID on the Chinese, yet Asians are still being targeted. From casual racist remarks to the recent shooting spree in the U.S. state of Georgia, anti-Asian attacks tripled in the past year. It's not only in America, nor only about the pandemic. Here in France, there have been several waves of protests in the past five years, and a new generation is speaking up where in the past, uh, first-generation immigrants tended to stay silent. We'll see how and ask about the growing cloud of Asians who don't fall under the banner of one monolithic block. The rest of the world knows it, from the emergence of Japanese mangas and K-pop to the growth of Mandarin as a foreign language taught in school, how to measure the growing embrace of Eastern culture against this intolerance of the ugliest kind. Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking how to stop Asian hate violence. And uh, joining us is a sociologist, Yahan Truong of the French National Institute of Demographic Studies. Your book comes out this week, A Model Minority, The Chinese of France and Anti-Asian Racism. Thanks for being with us. Sorry, I can't hear it. You can't hear me? I can't hear it. <laughs> ah, okay. But, but it's okay. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Also, also with us uh, is uh, we're pleased to welcome uh, Diana Liu uh, from our own uh, Observers uh, website, our investigative news website, uh, The Observers, uh, co-author of the blog Chop Chicks in Paris, where you look at oh, those restaurants that are right now closed, all those Asian restaurants, right? Exactly. All right. We'll Thank talk, you for having me. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, we'll introduce our other panelists uh, shortly. But before we do, um, I, I just want to ask you, Diana, uh, we'll just show, actually, the report that you put out uh, for the observers uh, this week. And yeah, well, as we were saying at the outset, it's not just that shooting spree in the suburbs of Atlanta last month where six of the eight victims were Asian women. In the past few months, videos like this of Asian Americans, mostly seniors, being pushed, robbed, and insulted have gone viral on social media. They're part of a troubling spike in anti-Asian violence and racism in the United States since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't want them under me. Tell them to move. Tell them to move. Move. Many believe that this bigotry also motivated the March 16 spa shootings in Atlanta, Georgia, where a white man took the lives of eight people, six of them Asian women. Russell Jung co-founded an initiative that tracks violence and harassment against Asian Americans. Collecting data in March 2020 of personal first-hand accounts of anti-Asian racism, and to date we have over 3,000 incidents. Go to you're China. A, you're on a construction yeah, company. Go, go to China. You're not from go here, you agent. We're actually getting pushed and shoved, um, having rocks and bottles thrown at us. In a high percentage of cases, we're getting coughed and spat upon. We weren't expecting President Trump to actually incite the virus more with his hate speech. He used terms like Chinese virus over and over, even when told that he shouldn't. Because it comes from China. Racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. That's why. It comes from China. I want to be accurate. It racialized a biological virus. So that created that automatic association of the virus with a people. In American history, there's a yellow peril fear that Asians would come and invade with their hordes of people, their numbers, taking away jobs, but also with their diseases. Despite the darkness and despite the sadness, people are really standing up to support the community, not only Asian Americans, but our allies. I see the Asian American community really flocking together at the moment. People from all walks of life, high school students and middle school students, engineers and teachers, union members and church leaders, everybody's standing up to resist the racism now. Asian Americans are really considering what's our place in America, because right now we're not allowed to belong. We're perceived as perpetual foreigners. It's galvanizing us to say, no, we want to create a new America where we do belong. 
All right, that, that report for the uh, Observer's uh, website here on France 24, compiled by Diana, D D Diana Liu, who's with us. Also with us and joining us for this conversation from Woodbridge, Connecticut, is Yale University professor of sociology, Grace Cow, co-author of The Anxiety of Being Asian American, Hate Crimes and Negative Biases During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, let, let me begin with you, Diana. So the... the um, all of this, as you point out in that report, is familiar ground, but the spike over the last year is real. Mm, yes. So, I mean, I think that for many Asian, for many Asian Americans, um, this violence and also this hatred towards the Asian community, it's shocking, yes. And it's especially shocking that it's been um, elderly people who... Um, who Asians hold in their community in extreme high esteem. It's been these elderly, um, helpless people, you know, our grandparents that have been that have been targeted. But on the other hand, um, when you understand a bit the history of um, anti-Asian violence and um, violence and hatred and this and, and legal discrimination in the in the United States, um, sadly, we also know that um, none of what is happening right now is truly new. None of it. None of it is truly new. Grace, did you feel it? The, this sort of when the pandemic hits a year ago, the, the was 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 the wave of uh, of palpable. Well, I was really grateful to have a job where I could mostly work from home. Honestly, I mean, I anticipated that this would happen. Um, Asian Americans have long been associated with you know being exotic, um, being strange, the disease carrying, but even the just the innocent TV coverage of Asians, you know, eating strange foods and the idea that this somehow came from um, a market or people ate bats and so forth. All these things contribute to, to the notion that Asians are, are disease carrying and just are strange. And for those of us who live in the U.S., we are never seen as truly American. All of us are always asked, you know, where are you from? Where are you really from? And so in my case, I'm from, you know, I live in Connecticut now. I used to live in Philadelphia when I taught at Penn. And, you know, I'm from San Francisco, California. But that answer is never going to satisfy anyone I talk to because they want to, you know, I have to trace my origins back to Asia, right? And I happen to be Chinese American. Um, so we experience this daily. We're also asked, you know, where did we learn to speak English so well? Um, because we can never truly be American. So, no, none of it surprised me. Um, I hate to say I agree that the the attacks, especially against the elderly and, of course, the the horrendous uh, murders of the women um, uh, in Atlanta is just it's it's that part is shocking and terrible. But I think the, you know, everyday negative incidents where people look at you funny or cough, at, you know, cough at you or might push you. I hate to say that that part did not surprise me at all. How much of this is down to Donald Trump? I think he takes he should take some of the blame, but not all of the blame, because, um, you know, the first immigration act to restrict um, individuals from entering the United States um, by national origin was targeted against the Chinese. Um, I, I'm, many of you have heard of the Page Act of 1875 that restricted um, the entry of uh, Chinese American women because they were seen to, you know, have um, immoral tendencies, right? So people thought they were prostitutes um, and so forth. And we went from that to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and then the, you know, um, Gentlemen's Agreement Act, which restricted Japanese Americans. And really, by 1917, the U.S. had shut its borders to um, people all over Asia. And so this is why the label um, Asian American is real. It's not, sometimes this is confusing. People that come from China, from the Philippines, from Korea, they might not see themselves as part of part of this label, but it is something that is, is American. It's been part of our history since the founding of this country. I want to bring into this conversation from New York City, Elizabeth uh, Ouyang, civil rights attorney. Thank you for joining us here in the in the France 24 debate. You're welcome. So uh, you've worked. There's been several instances in, in New York City and uh, uh, of late. Uh, and we saw one of those examples uh, in, in the report that Diana compiled for us. Um, and it, it isn't 
it, it doesn't fit a particular mold who's carrying out these attacks. Often cases, it's other minorities. Um, I think what's important to recognize is that um, Africans, Latinos, and Asian Americans have a history of being marginalized. And we have actually more in common uh, than we do um, apart. Uh, the incidents of hate crimes in New York City have been committed by all races, by all genders, uh, including other minority groups. And you took up the case in particular. There was a case that happened recently uh, in the Bronx. These four teenage girls um, on a bus uh, assault a, a 51-year-old uh, woman, uh, hit her on the head with an umbrella, and blame her for COVID. And you followed the case. You told the New York Times how you feel as though the, once you, the girls had been spoken to, that they did feel remorse. I believe strongly in restorative justice. Uh, I lead a program now in its 15th year, a hate crimes prevention art project. We stepped up last year uh, because of the surge of anti-Asian violence and got three of the four girls involved in the incident that you just spoke about into our program. And that was critical. They learned self-confidence, not to be followers, um, and uh, to believe in their own values. They learned that they have um, control over their future. If they want to be a corrections officer uh, a, in the healthcare field, et cetera, having a criminal record will impede their ability to do so. And they learn from other Asian American teenagers in the program that they also share their concern about Black Lives Matters, et cetera, things that they care about. Um, so uh, I am convinced after having gone through our project, they will never commit another hate crime again. I think we need more restorative justice programs like that across the country, and resources need to be devoted to um, those types of programs mental health issues, as well as homelessness issues. And right now, the U.S. Justice Department is reviewing how to handle this. Is that something that they're considering? Uh, more of those, as you put it, restorative justice programs? I know that there is a real push for it, um, that uh, particularly um, among uh, young people or uh you know, low-level offenses, um, restorative justice program uh, has proven to be effective. And even among serious crimes, there should be an element of restorative justice, maybe not immediately, but along down the road, uh, when it's appropriate, when it's safe, um, there should always be uh, uh, an effort to try to make um, people as productive members of society as possible, and that includes um, being aware of why they caused certain things and being held accountable. And, to, and, and with that example of the attack on the bus, how does the victim feel about it? The victim is great. She agreed to this arrangement because she doesn't want it to happen to anyone else. These were young teens in their, you know, 15-year-old uh, teenagers. They've got their whole life ahead of them. Um, and so it was important to turn it around and nip it in the butt. And they did. Um, you know, the one person who was the main uh, person involved is still at large. The three girls in our program were followers. Um, and, but they learned from our program to have self-confidence and stand up for what they believe in and not to be followers, but to be leaders. And we said at the outset of this uh, program, it's not just in the United States uh, where we've seen this spike. We've had cases of fellow journalists in the newsroom who've told us how people on the on the metro have uh, w moved away from them. And uh, maybe you've experienced uh, something like this when the, when the pandemic first hit. Um, but I want to I want to ask uh, at this point. Last month, uh, five st young students here in Paris uh, stood trial because they had on Twitter called for uh, put out tweets last October. 
Uh, very shocking ones. I'll, I'll read uh, one of them. Let's see if I find my my um, my, my notes here. Um, uh, in one one of them, uh, which calls uh, on quote my black and Arab brothers from the banlieue, the working class suburbs, to attack each Chinese they meet on the streets. The ruling is expected on uh, on May the twenty sixth. Um, your thoughts on that, Yahan Chong, on that particular case itself. Yeah, uh, actually, the all this appeal for the uh, great, uh, for the attacks were all happening on the evening of the twenty eighth October, uh, when Emmanuel Macron announced for the second lockdown in France. So uh, what we have seen. Uh, since what we have seen since the last uh, spring is that the uh, COVID-19 actually um, provoked and reactivated all the hate about the Asian people of different um, different kind of stereotypes are all uh, converged together and focus on the Asian. So uh, ever since the, the spring, since the first lockdown, there were there were already been uh, a huge waves of um, uh, discrimination in different areas on the street, on the transport. And I think what happened. Uh, during the, uh, that particular evening is that uh, with the emotion and all the frustration of the second lockdown coming on, so uh, the emotion and the need to um, have a new scapegoat, uh, scapegoat sorry, uh, were projected again among the Asian population. And uh, it's not a coincidence that um, he mentioned about the banlieue, the banlieue because um, we know that Chinese migrants in France are very much uh, uh, work as entrepreneurs. So uh, the special concentration in some specific uh, uh, working class neighbors in the northern suburbs of Paris also reinforced this um, idea about a, a community that is uh, monolithic, uh, who is better off than all the other minorities, which might reinforce um, the, the need and the prejudice on this um, population as the target. of. And, and as far as this case itself goes, what Again, we've just been talking about restorative justice in the case of that one example in New York City. What, mm -hmm. what, what, I mean, what, what, what outcome do you see for these five young students who are, who are charged and who are waiting again for the ruling on, uh, on what kind of, whether they'll be proven innocent or guilty and what the sentence might be? Uh, yeah, um, I was in the I was in the process the day of the twenty four the, the trial. So um, it is true that um, we can feel that it's a it's a uh, it's something that was a very much taken seriously by um, by the judge. Um, although the five people um, in the beginning they are kind of confused about um, the the result. They also insisted that uh, it was a, a rage. It was something that they, they did not consider. It was something unconsidered, immature, just emotional, and especially with nothing about um, Chinese in, in France or Asian in France. Um, they they knew nothing about the Chinese community in France. Uh, yeah, because some the, some posts actually uh, were more related to China as the uh, as a country, uh, but there were some more explicit about, about the Chinese. So, um, I think the result is also to make people understand more this um, link between uh, the hate about the represent representation of China as a country and and the, and the geopolitical. That are here, we're going to pick yes. up on that point when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're discussing that spike in uh, anti-Asian uh, hate with hate crimes, some of which uh, have had tragic consequences uh, over the past year. We're talking about it with sociologist Yahan Chuang. Your book out this week, uh, A Model Minority, The Chinese of France and Anti-Asian uh, Racism. Uh, from New York City civil rights attorney Elizabeth Ouyang, uh, Yale University sociologist uh, Grace Cow is with us uh, from Woodbridge, Connecticut. Uh, uh, you're the co-author of The Anxiety of Being Asian American, Hate Crimes and Negative Biases During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And from uh, the uh, France 24 investigative news website, The Observers, Diana Liu is with us uh, as well, co-author of the blog, Chop Chicks in Paris. It's all, it's, there's three of you, right? And you're all from California? Um, yeah, yeah, you can, and, you can say that. And you all, and yeah. you, you do restaurant reviews and, and the such. Yes. Okay. Uh, we were well, we, we were just talking before the break uh, uh, about uh, 
the, the, the spike that's been felt um, uh, throughout when it comes to, uh, to uh, be, uh, of, of anti-Asian hate crimes and the confusion that you mentioned, uh, Yahan Chuang, uh, mixing together uh, geopolitics, what's happening in China, and the communities uh, that are here. Um, in San Francisco's Chinatown, uh, well, there's, the people have been reacting. There's an increase uh, in attacks on Asian Americans that's prompted loads of new volunteers to offer their services to a safety patrol there. And that's nothing new here. Back in 2019, French daily newspaper Libération reported on community patrols organized by Asians who live in the housing projects of Paris's northern uh, working class uh, suburbs. Again, those northern working class suburbs that you were describing just before the break, Jan. And we all remember 2016 when there was uh, um, the murder uh, in the northern uh, working class suburb of Aubervilliers of uh, a, a Chinese immigrant. And that really marked people. Uh, it, it, it left, a, it was a huge shock. Yeah, actually, um the problem is that Chinese, uh, because of the fact that many Chinese migrants are very much invested, engaged in the um, uh, as immigrant entrepreneurs. So uh, there has been a stereotype conceiving uh, all the Chinese of being uh, entrepre successful entrepreneurs and therefore are richer than normal people. And also, on the other hand, uh, Chinese are also imaginers uh, who are more reluctant to um, uh, to file their plans to police in case of the aggression. So for the two, th uh, of, because of the two factors together, so uh, there has been um, an attack uh, uh, of Chinese and Asian people in uh, the urban, especially in the suburbs of Paris. Uh, so what happened in 2016 was nothing new because there has been a demonstration since 2010, 2011, and even before that, there has been many associations in Paris trying to help in now uh, Chinese migrants. But of course, um, uh, what happened to Chao Lin Zhang uh, was the most uh, dramatic and tragic incident the outcome of all this. Yeah, the, 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 Grace Cow, what you're hearing uh, Yahan describe about Paris's suburbs, does that have a familiar ring to you? I mean, yes and no. I think I think um, Asian American immigration to this country is different. Um, I don't know if people have a sense of what San Francisco is like. You just mentioned San Francisco's Chinatown. So San Francisco is 35% Asian American. So you don't actually have to go to Chinatown or any particular neighborhood to see lots of Asian Americans. Um, and I, I do think that, um, that the prevalence, you know, and there are, there are suburbs outside of San Francisco that are over 50% Asian American. So people do have some resentment that might come from the economic um, anxiety. Um, but I think a lot of it is just... Um, Asian American faces, and it goes far beyond Chinese people. Even though the fear might be of China and of COVID-19, um, most people can't tell all of us apart, right? So it's really someone who has dark hair. Um, the woman who was attacked um, in, in New York recently, where the two security guards closed the door on her, she was a Filipino-American woman. Um, as you mentioned, the Atlanta murders, um, some of them were Korean American, some were Chinese American. Um, frankly, I don't think I think this just goes far beyond um, Chinese Americans, and it's consistent with the history of the U.S. at least of you know treating all Asian Americans um, as a monolith. So, so I don't even know if it's related to the actual experiences um, or even the economic positions of individual Asian Americans. And I do want to put point out about just the demography of. Of, of things that we talked about. So 43% of Asian Americans in the US live in three states. So they live in California, New York, and Texas. So, you know, there are lots of cases in San Francisco and New York um, and LA. And on the ground, I think that's really shocking to people that live there. My mother lives in San Francisco. Um, these cases have terrified her. She doesn't want to leave the house. Um, every conversation I have with her, with my sisters, is about her personal safety. But the truth is, there's also more Asian Americans, more Chinese Americans in these places. So there, you would expect more cases, right? Because there's more people at risk of being attacked. Um, so I, I don't want to, it's not that there's something, I don't think there's something particular uh, about these locations where everyone has suddenly become um, more racist than they were a year ago. But I do think there is also a population um, story. So a place where there are no Asian Americans, you're not going to count 
a lot of hate crimes, right? Because mm. there's just not a lot of people for that to happen to. Diana Lou, when you compare France to uh, the United States, is it the same? And this, is it the same in the way the authorities react and the way other people react? Um, well, I feel like in France, actually, um, there is more um, there is more per there is more persecution of verbal hate crimes. So um, before, when we were talking about the in the incident, the tweet in October of last year, when um, I think it was a five or six university age um, men were sending out tweets saying, you know, calling everyone to attack um, Asian people, um, and then we talked about how this was then pers um, you know this has been brought as a case to the French court. I feel like in the I feel like in the United States it can be sometimes it can be a bit more difficult to persecute people just on the Prosecute. basis yes just on the basis of um, on the basis of ver of verbal hate crimes um, you know and especially um, in the streets too. And what about attitudes? Mm, well, I think that you know I th that's a bit. It's difficult that's to generalize. A, uh, that's a bit difficult to judge, but I feel like, um, but I feel like, although in France there has also been a wave of um, anti-Asian hate, anti-Asian violence, I do feel like it's been a bit more. I, fe I feel like it's been a bit more widespread and marked in the U in the United States, and I do think that this has something to do with the um, with the history of anti-Asian racism and discrimination in the U.S. That's you know very that's very particular to this country, and it also has to do with the role that um, with the role of President Trump in exacerbating these kinds of um, and in exacerbating and also normalizing these kinds of attitudes. Towards, um, towards Chinese that we didn't see with um, with the French president, with the French authorities, and, and that does that does make a difference. Does it also make a difference? I'll put it to you, Elizabeth Huyang, in 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 the way um, communities react. Uh, I know that older generations tend to want to make less waves, or at least here in France, that seems to be the case. Uh, has the Trump presidency? forced people to be more vocal when there are little slights that become big ones? Absolutely. Uh, in the United States, we're still very much living in the post-Trump era. We are dealing with the mess that he left us. When the president, in a sentence, can uh, make an irresponsible statement, calling it a China virus and fueling anti-immigrant sentiment on top of the COVID-19 um, anti-Asian sentiment. Uh, he had a platform that reached millions because uh, he was president. Um, and we, community-based groups, uh, are playing, uh, having to deal with that um, emboldening of white supremacist groups across this country for the past four years. Uh, so even though he's left office, uh, what he has left us with is going to take a long time to be able to reach that type of platform that he had and the millions uh, that need to uh, be educated. Uh, you, we heard earlier Grace talking about uh, uh, the demographics of the uh, Asian communities uh, and the Chinese American communities uh, in the U.S. Uh, those those communities are growing fast. They're the fastest growing immigrant communities. And, and by the way, Elizabeth, I almost forgot to say, uh, I guess, congratulations, because I know you teach at New York University. And uh, Chinese-born director Chloe Zhao has uh, won Best Director and Best Picture for Nomadland at the BAFTAs, Britain's answer to the, to the Oscars. And she went to NYU Film School. Uh, again, this is, uh, is, is it a sign of the times, her, her, her winning those statues? Um, I think it's important uh, to give this context, both in the United States and in France. Um, what we've talked about, what you've alluded to, uh, the history and so forth, underlying it is white supremacy. And in the United States, by the year 2045, we will be a majority-minority country. And so this is no surprise to any of us on this panel. Um, and this fear of the unknown, this fear of um, tipping the status quo uh, 
is causing a lot of the underlying sentiment to rise. Um, and I think that is what we need to nip and we need to learn to integrate, to get to know one another. Um, so there isn't that fear factor. Um, and because when there's that fear factor in the extreme, it results uh, in violence and uh, what we are uh, seeing a surge of recently. So Grace Cow, there seems to be both. On the one hand, the fear of the unknown, as was uh, just uh, expressed by Elizabeth. But on the other, so many people are embracing uh, uh, trademarks of, uh, of Eastern culture, like K-pop, for instance, which I know you're is something that you follow. Uh, the fact that you know we're 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 uh, embracing a lot of Eastern culture uh, is it a race between tolerance and intolerance? It's you know it's really dangerous. Um, I am a huge fan of BTS, and I do think it's important. But I also think that a lot of the the association of Asian Americans is with the foreign um, element, and so I do think. It's important that just plain old American things, you know, Hollywood films, TV shows, all this, all of these kinds of media have people that look like um, folks on this panel, but we're just ordinary Americans. So we're not some exotic, you know, flower from, <laughs> from the East or anything like that. Um, I think BTS is extremely important and the rest of K-pop because it is, um, they have been able to um, cross um, the borders of South Korea all over Europe, uh, Latin America, and the U.S. Um, it does normalize seeing people that are Asian American, the faces. And I think for Asian American men in particular, there's been such a dearth of Asian American men in the media that are that can be seen as romantic leads. Um, there's a long history of Asian American men, the absence of them in Hollywood. And even when they're present, you know, they're, they're seen as somehow asexual. Um, and quiet and feminine in a way that women are also seen as feminines. And I, I strongly believe that the images we have of Asian American women go hand in hand with those of Asian American men. So I am hopeful that um, some of the examples you gave, but also um, just the having Asian faces around um, makes people that look like me and the rest of the panel just seem a little bit less foreign. Is, is there here in France, Yahan Truong, a normalization uh, the, the, of, the, of the like that uh, Grace is hoping for, there, where you just look at them? Yeah, actually, uh, if we look at the activism um, from the Asian youth in France, uh, there has been two pillars. So one pillar is about against discrimination, um, uh, more conventional form of uh, demonstration. But the other form has been uh, this cultural activism, trying to be more visible in the room. Um, the East Asian culture, like BTS, it has been an important source for the uh, French uh, Asian youth to uh, as a source of recognition. But in the same time, also the second generation uh, Asian in France, uh, they have developed their own uh, video, their own telefilms, uh, uh, even magazine, trying to better promote the image of the Asian culture. Uh, so this is also a way to um, get a better place in the national community. And, and it's, it's, you're noticing that difference. And, and you, Diana? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I actually have noticed that as well, and particularly in the world of, um, in the world of gastronomy in France. You know, as we all well know, um, gastronomy is one of the you know, most highly prized art forms in France. And in my work, um, in my work, um, interviewing and writing about uh, Asian restaurants in France and Asian restauranteurs, I've really seen that um, people are young restauranteurs. People, you know, from the, um, you know, people of the second generation are really using food uh, as something to, as a um, tool, as a method to elevate, um, to elevate. Asian culture and also to establish a place for um, a for Asian food and also um, Asian fu fusion. So um, fusing, let's say, um, Japanese cuisine with French with French cuisine. And I think that in this way, it's it's really it's really establishing, you could say, the cultural capital, the cultural clout 
of um, you know this part of Asian culture that's so beloved to the Asian community, food in a language that France can understand, which is you know the, which is the which is the language of gastronomy. You know many uh, many restaurants here. So I'm thinking of um, I'm thinking of Celine Chung and Billy Pham of the popular restaurant uh, Bao Family in Paris. So when they first when they first started their restaurant, um, a lot of the branding was actually focused on um, getting rid of stereotypes that French people hold about Asian food. So, for instance, that um, Asian people um, eat rats and they eat, and they eat dogs. And a lot of the um, the the message of um, this restaurant was really pushing back against. Uh, against uh, negative stereotypes that are rooted in food and also, um, you know, kind of making Asian culture something that is not foreign, some, that's not exo exotic, but something that's cool, something that um, can be integrated and enjoyed by and, the French. And this is fascinating because there's really two types of uh, Chinese restaurants in Paris. There are those who cater to French people and those that cater to all those tourists who, well, not with the pandemic, but who now come and 10 years ago or 20 years ago, n there were none of them. And now, uh, do you get a sense that the arrival, the, this, this tale of globalization with more and more Chinese coming to Paris, that that's helping to break down those barriers? Um, I actually don't know if it's, um, well, yes and no. Uh, yes, because of course, with the, um, you know, with the influx of tourists from, a from, from, from Asia, there are certain, uh, there are, there are restaurants and let's say bubble tea, uh, change. It's a kind of drink that cater more towards, um, you could say, more, more the more authentic tastes of these people. But at the same time, I think what I see is a really, is really a influx, is really a um, meeting, in, is really a meeting in between, let's say, more um, French food, food tastes and, um, you know, more, uh, and more authentic tastes from Asia. But, you know, the credit of creating this meeting point between these two, you know, uh, very different cultures, very different gastronomic cultures. I think that credit really goes to the second generation of uh, entrepreneurs, of um, cooks, and you know, even of artists, of um, of 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 YouTubers. Like of, the um, like the second yeah. generation yes. that Yahan was describing when it came to making. Uh, uh, f uh, videos and films and music. Uh, one final question, yeah. a little political question here. Could New York City soon have its first Asian American mayor? Ten weeks until the Democratic Party's primary in the U.S.'s largest city and former presidential candidate Andrew Yang is currently leading a crowded field. I, I know it's early days, uh, Elizabeth Uyang, and uh, but just th that's it. I mean, New York has never had an Asian American mayor. What does that tell you, the fact that he's the front runner right now? I think that, um, you know, uh, it brings hope to particularly the younger generation uh, that uh, it is possible to elect someone who happens to be Asian American. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, the field of food. Um, but there are so many occupations where we are not represented, politics being one of them. Um, and so uh, having Andrew Yang run for mayor of New York City uh, has really given a lot of people uh, hope that uh, we are included in this process, uh, in this political process. Um, and so we'll have to see. Uh, but the challenge is not to only appreciate our food um, and uh, in t in good times, but when there's bad times, when there's COVID-19, when there's economic recessions, that we are not scapegoated at the same time. And that's the challenge, is to appreciate the contributions of Asian and Asian Americans worldwide in all different fields. All right. And, and I want to add that very oh, briefly, because we're almost our, out of time. Grace Cowell, fly, okay. final word. Our new vice president is an Asian American woman. So I do want to add that there is hope. And there, I think there has been more Asian Americans who ran for office the last couple of years. So 
it, it's not just Andrew Yang in New York City. Okay. Grace Cow from Woodbridge, Connecticut. Thank you so much for being with us uh, uh, in the France 24 debate. I want to thank, uh, as well as Elizabeth Uyang uh, in New York City, uh, Yahan Chuang and uh, Diana Liu. Uh, you can see that report again if you missed it on our Observer's website. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.